Welcome to lecture one of the course Mind and Brain. In this first lecture, we'll present you with a course overview, some information about the course. Uh, we'll start by introducing the concept of consciousness and then discuss subject dualism. Let me first introduce myself so you have some kind of idea of what type of philosopher is teaching you the first part of this Mind and Brain course. My name is Hans Dorimel. I work at the Department of Philosophy of Tilburg University. Uh, I did get my uh, master's degree there, that is, I got my uh, doctorandus title, which is similar to uh, the master these days. Uh, I got it in philosophy of language, and my supervisor was Philip Bugens, who now is uh, my colleague in the department. Uh, I wrote my uh, PhD thesis on the evolution of uh, consciousness uh, in Nijmegen, and my supervisor there was Tom Derniksen. And these days I mainly teach philosophy, philosophy of science, philosophy of uh, mind, and uh, most of uh, the students I have uh, are psychology students and uh, liberal arts and sciences students. So uh, I teach this course. The second part of this course will be taught by uh, Jeroen Stekelenburg. Uh, I've written uh, the textbook for the first part of this course, Eight Questions About the Conscious Mind. And these days I always uh, I also use that as uh, the introduction uh, in the mind-body debate for the philosophy of mind course I teach together with Stefan Blanke for the psychology students and together with Herman Recht. You probably know him from the Thinking About Science course. I am writing uh, a book for the second part of that philosophy of mind for psychology uh, course. So together with him, I teach uh, a course in the Bachelor of Philosophy on epistemology. So that's basically the first part, uh, the first lectures on um, uh, of the Thinking About Science course. Um, and uh, well, of course, then going to uh, Quine at the end. Uh, so I also teach philosophy of science to psychology students. I do this together with my colleague, uh, Michael Vlerik, and we do this uh, from the book, out of the book, uh, Exploring Humans. And Herman and I are finishing uh, the revised, the actual revised edition, some 200 extra pages. Uh, well, I hope we'll finish that uh, around now when this uh, lecture is due. The original Exploring Humans, uh, I wrote together not only with Herman Recht, but also with Marie Schouten, who is unfortunately no longer with us. So that's why uh, we have been rewriting that book, uh, just the two of us. Uh, with Maurice, we also wrote the book Stuff to Denken. Um, well, matters to think, think about, matters to think about. Uh, roughly translated, it's a, it's a pun uh, and it doesn't work in English. Uh, which is a, a introduction uh, in philosophy of mind that is a bit more complicated than the eight questions book. Uh, the eight questions book is meant for first year students, and the Stoff to Denke book was meant for uh, third year students of psychology, who also now have the philosophy of mind course in the first year and in English. So I'm using I'm using the eight questions book there as well. Uh, together with Hermann, I teach a course in neuroethics. So if you're going to do the cognitive neuroscience track, you'll get us there again. Uh, we haven't written our own book there, uh, our own textbook, but we use the very, very brilliant book, uh, Brain Trust, uh, by Patricia Churchland. Uh, I can recommend this to anyone who is interested in ethics uh, anyway. Uh, it's, well, better than any book on addicts I've ever uh, uh, read, and I've read a lot on addicts. Uh, so I also teach a uh, master thesis course for philosophy, which basically is uh, a course in uh, uh, writing the master thesis and helping students to uh, get started. Um, 
as you can see, uh, I have a lot of students. So uh, each philosophy uh, course for psychology students is between, well, say 600 and 1,000 students, depending a bit on uh, the, the year. Uh, I've already all the liberal arts and sciences students for the first year, uh, and then uh, some a couple of extra courses. So I got fifteen hundred to two thousand somewhere in between students each year, which makes it hard to answer all uh, emails, for instance. So I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, so I've been teaching philosophy since two thousand. So just to give you an impression of what I did uh, prior to this, I've taught philosophy of language, philosophy of cognition, philosophy of communication, the history of contemporary uh, philosophy. And believe it or not, I'm not a Kantian, but I have taught uh, philosophy of science from a Kantian perspective for uh, a couple of years. I've taught a lot of academic writing and also, uh, so I worked also at a lot of universities, uh, both the University of Amsterdam University of Nijmegen, University of Groningen. Uh, I've taught in the honors program of the psychology program of uh, the University of Amsterdam and Tilburg University. I taught at a honors program together with Herman. And last but not least, I've taught a couple of years of philosophy at a high school in bergen op -Zoom. Uh, a half or end of area, we have two types of uh, high school in the Netherlands that uh, we have we have more types of high school, but there are two that have uh, uh, philosophy in their program. Uh, and it used to be only the type that you needed to get to uh, university, VBO. Uh, so the philosophy course courses were and uh, books were initially written for just that type of school, and then they said to the, the, the pupils in high school of Havo, well, uh, you don't have to read everything in a book. And well, I've done Havo myself, and very well later. Uh, so I found that not very, well, not very nice to uh, these uh, Havo uh, students. So uh, I pressed uh, a publisher into writing uh, uh, at least uh, a uh, workbook for Havo, and it is, and later other publishers followed, and now Herman and I have also uh, contributed to uh, a uh, high school method, Durf te Denken, Dare to Think, which both has a textbook uh, for Havo and a textbook for Vario. For, for, for so, um, a little improvement in high school philosophy courses there, I think. Together with Hermann, so you can see, you probably knew that already, when I think about science course, uh, I work a lot together with Hermann. We wrote a book, uh, What Nonsense, What Nonsense, it's an introduction, a popular philosophy book in uh, philosophy of science. So it's in Dutch, of course, um, but if you read chapter five, that has a list of demarcation criteria, that is basically the introduction into philosophy of science anyone should read and we wrote a book at Snapkevoel uh, the feeling of understanding basically which is a book on epistemology and also uh, in Dutch and it's a popular uh, uh, philosophy book other things I did I wrote uh, a philosophical and historical detective with René Descartes all as, as uh, a kind of 17th century Sherlock Holmes uh, also in Dutch, uh, it got quite uh, a good review in uh, the Volkskrant, uh, so I was really happy with that. And uh, the last book I did was uh, I did the editing for it was a book for Monica Meising when she uh, uh, retires, and that's uh, a book that is has been out since August, August. 2020 and this book is mainly about her views on what a person is she she's written a book of course about that and uh, these are all kinds uh, mostly are responses to that book but also other uh, papers on uh, the things she is an expert in right so um, I think you now have some kind of idea what type of philosopher I am uh, when I'm teaching uh, and uh, 
let's take a look at the course. Let me start with a warning. This is an extremely difficult course. Um, you might not believe me, so ask around students that did this course uh, in previous years. They're probably, uh, well, around somewhere in these COVID times. Uh, it's uh, hard to communicate, of course, but uh, well, uh, this is definitely not the easiest course there is. Um, it requires a lot of abstract thinking uh, and a lot of studying uh, of new things that might be counterintuitive. So um, try to keep up, try to read every week what you need to read and uh, also take a look at uh, the tutorials. Uh, at the moment I, when I'm recording this, I am not sure uh, what I'm going to do with the tutorials, but uh, Either I'm going to do something with uh, uh, on Canvas uh, with actual trying to give you tutorials, or otherwise I'll uh, present you with other material uh, that replaces the tutorials. There are, besides these uh, clips, these movies of uh, the lectures, there are knowledge clips. So. Uh, in a moment you'll see that we'll discuss in this first part of uh, the course in the mind part of the course all kinds of answers to the question um, how the mind fits in the physical world all these different answers i made and we will do that in a historical uh, overview uh, all these different answers i made uh, knowledge clips for or uh, i uh, paid people to help me to do that and since last year, there are also knowledge clips in English, uh, so I can use them for you guys. So, for instance, today we're going to talk about substance dualism. Uh, very, very briefly, in a couple of minutes, this knowledge clip gives you the highlights. So, uh, and in the end, so it's kind of a whiteboard thingy that is in, uh, where things are explained, and uh, you can see that. Uh, Think are drawn there, uh, so um, things are explained about substance dualism. Uh, they're five minutes, so they really don't replace uh, the entire lecture and the text in the book. So, uh, but they do provide you an overview, and, and at the end of all these um, uh, knowledge clips, we zoom out, so you have a. a um, kind of a whiteboard just like here in the picture that presents you with an overview of substance dualism in this case, but I also have behaviorism, idealism, etc. So you have uh, something that helps you uh, study and of course put all the details in uh, that are not in the knowledge clips. But uh, it provides you with uh, some guidance uh, in seeing what we are doing in the first half of this so the word groups, the tutorials are not compulsory. Uh, I am not sure what we're going to do. Uh, so look at Canvas, uh, what we do if this COVID-19 crisis has not been resolved. If this clip is on Canvas, it's probably not uh, resolved. So there's no vaccine or no working vaccine. Uh, so they're not compulsory and roll anyway, because if I'm going to do things like breakout rooms uh, or uh, whatever we have in Canvas, uh, then you have to be enrolled. So enroll uh, anyway for a course, for the course, and enroll also in the work groups. Uh, they are not compulsory, but they are highly recommended, of course. Uh, and you have apparently have to enroll for the work groups in Osiris, and I can't do that. I have no extra, no no lecturer has access to Osiris. So anything having to do with enrollment in OSIRIS, don't ask your teachers, don't ask your lecturers. Uh, we cannot enroll you. You have to go to the student desk if you have problems there. Uh, I would, I would, uh, I wish I could help you there. So if you if you are not enrolled in Canvas, I can enroll you there manually. That's no problem. But 
if I do that, you're still not enrolled in OSIRIS. So no lecturer can enroll you in OSIRIS. And uh, I guess all lecturers can enroll you in Canvas if that's what you want us to do. So uh, if, for instance, you have trouble enrolling in OSIRIS, you can ask me to enroll you in Canvas so you can access the PowerPoint slides, uh, etc. Uh, but I can't enroll you then in OSIRIS and that might take maybe longer to resolve. So uh, it would be convenient that I already enroll you in uh, Canvas. If that's the case, uh, just send me an email and I'll do that shortly. So um, it could be the case, of course, that we have a couple of uh, these lectures that you have to watch a movie like this. Uh, and I make these movies, so there will be no problems with Wi-Fi, etc. Uh, so it's all I also put them on YouTube. So if Canvas doesn't work, just look at them uh, on YouTube. Uh, type in uh, Hans Dorgemaal in YouTube, and you'll find the playlist uh, for uh, the Mind and Brain uh, lectures. So usually after the Mind part, there is a midterm with open questions and that will be 50 percent of your grade and after the rain part there will be an end term about uh brain and uh, brain uh part of the course that will also be 50 percent of your grade so pretty straightforward and there will be a reset uh, at in in the reset period uh, that that is about both uh parts so the entire course uh so as of September 2015 is the highest score that counts. So if your reset is lower than uh, your original exam, uh, that is, uh, then you have uh, the, the grade of the first attempt. Partial grades, mind you, are only valid in the scientific, uh, sorry, in the academic year, and you obtain them. So you can't take uh, uh, the grade of uh, the mind part if you pass there to the next year if you didn't pass the brain part, uh, if you didn't do the brain part. So the, 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 uh, the, the grades compensate. So if you have a 10 for the mind part and a 2 for the brain part, then you have 12 in total divided by 2 is a 6, right? So uh, that is uh, how the grade is calculated. So you don't necessarily need to pass both with a 6 or higher. You need to pass the course. Uh, okay, so uh, what happens if uh, we're still in this COVID-19 crisis? Uh, I'm now, now just talking about the mind part because uh, Jeroen might uh, do something different for uh, the brain part. So uh, I guess that I'll do the same as last year. I'll do an essay. Uh, that is a bit easier in the sense that you can look all things up. Uh, but still, last year, uh, the passing grade for the mind port was not 100%. So uh, uh, if we'll do that, I'll post more information on Canvas. I just posted the topic and the requirements and the deadline. And uh, I'll make sure that it's there in time. Um, and if we do that, we... <clears throat> We do not have all these problems there are with online uh, proctoring and all that kind of nonsense. Uh, it doesn't work anyway. Uh, so why would we even bother to, uh, well, for us lecturers to uh, make exams in that way and grade them in that way? They are basically ungradable, it doesn't work. And for you, you have all the extra stress. Making the exam is stressful enough, at least for uh, many students. So having a camera pointed at you is is not a good idea. It's, it's, and it's a, you have all these privacy issues and uh, well, proctoring doesn't work. It's, it's a con, I think. The general problem we try to solve in the mind part, or at least in the mind part of this course, is how does the conscious mind fit in the physical world? Basically, I'll present you with an historical overview of the different answers to this question. Uh, taking a historical overview 
gives you the advantage of seeing where contemporary answers to this question come from. So if you, if you go back to earlier times, you'll see why people gave the answers they gave. And then responses to that give you insight in how we developed the ideas we have now. If I would start by uh, explaining our contemporary ideas on how the conscious mind fits in the physical world, I would just say, well, clearly uh, mental states are identical uh, to certain uh, brain states, or even I would say mental events are uh, identical to certain uh, brain processes. Uh, you might raise all kinds of objections to that. While when we start with dualism, as we do today, then you'll see how we get to the, the, the ideas we have now. So basically it is an historical overview and in the end of the mind part you'll see that we need to learn more about the brain and that is what Yoon uh, uh, will uh, be doing. He will be teaching you about uh, the mind and the brain, especially the brain of course. Um, so this is not just an academic matter. So why is this relevant? Well Think, for instance, for uh, about uh, someone who has had a bad accident, uh, does not respond to any stimuli. Uh, you ask people, you ask a person uh, uh, you might love, uh, a friend, a family member. Uh, you ask this person something, and well, he or she is just lying in his hospital bed with all the tubes and the uh, machines. And then the question is, well, is this person still conscious? Uh, well, how do you decide that? Well, then you need to know what consciousness is and how it fits in the physical world, how it relates to brain activity or certain types of brain activity, for instance. So it's really uh, a practical uh, question, uh, not just something we philosophers would like to know. Uh, less pressing, but still an interesting question, of course, is whether it is possible for uh, robots or computers to think if you're interested in artificial intelligence, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, can a robot not only think, uh, but also feel, for instance? Uh, does it make sense to make to try to make a robot or a computer that can, can feel? So that, that is important. And of course, uh, this is a really pressing question in contemporary uh, society. And that's what we try to do here at the university, understanding society and also we try to understand society because we want to advance society. So can animals suffer? Uh, should we all become vegans, for instance? Uh, if animals cannot suffer, well, then you might become vegan because it's better for the planet, uh, but not because uh, eating meat is uh, especially harmful to animals. Uh, but if they can experience pain, and stress and stuff like that, if they have such types of conscious states, then uh, well, you might become have to become a vegan, even uh, if it would not make any difference for the rest of the planet, for instance. So this is not just an academic matter. How does the mind, how does the conscious mind fit in the physical world? What is the conscious mind? Uh, how does it fit in uh, the rest of the world? Uh, is really an important question. Okay, do we have a mind? Well, we're not going uh, to uh, doubt that. We're not skeptics. Uh, you know, thinking about science course, you have enough uh, material uh, that enables you to uh, defeat the skeptic. So it seems obvious we do. We can think, we can feel emotions. We have all kinds of experiences. Uh, I'll go to in more detail what I mean by uh, those uh, terms, of course. But uh, so in the, in the rest of this course, we'll uh, just assume that we do have minds. So that's the assumption. And I think it's not a strange assumption. If you step into a nail, into a nail you experience pain. Uh, so if you uh, take a sip of coffee, hmm, you will experience coffee. You have this nice taste, if you like coffee, that is. Um, so that is uh, why we say we do have minds. We're not going to uh, be skeptical about the physical world or about the mind. So uh, we're not skeptics. 
Uh, of course, we should keep an open mind about what the mind actually is and what its place in the physical world is. Uh, we have all kinds of intuitions about that and our intuitions might be false. So keep an open mind, but also if you uh, think about thinking about science course, uh, you don't accept any hypothesis just because it might be possible or something like that. No, it should be falsifiable, of course, and, and your hypothesis should come with some empirical evidence before you uh, accept it. It's uh, always wrong to accept anything uh, based on insufficient evidence. So you need evidence before you uh, accept a hypothesis. So we're going to think about the mind. The mind matters, but how should we think about the mind? In the mind part of this course, I'll present you with an historical overview. And the book, Eight Questions About the Conscious Mind, also is a historical overview. So uh, there are eight questions. So those are the numbers between brackets uh, and uh, the yellow uh, words, mind one, mind two, etc., are the numbers, the names of uh, the uh, first seven lectures. So uh, we'll start today by answering the question, what is the conscious mind? So that is a preliminary answer to that, that also might change. And then we'll take a look at the first historical view that answers the question, how the mind fits in a physical world. And that is substance dualism. And substance dualism argues that the mind can function and separation uh, of the brain. And then we'll look at um, idealism, behaviorism, identity theory, and then we'll look at functionalism and connectionism, both claiming that machines can have conscious minds, and then we'll take it from there and see whether we have to adjust our intuitions, and we're going to do some thought experiments, and uh, we're going to think about the importance of the body, and the uh, environment you're living in and maybe even saying that well maybe the environment is part of uh, our conscious mind or can be part of our cognitive mind at least um, and we'll end by posting some problems thinking about some problems of uh, scientific about scientific thinking about uh, the conscious mind is it even possible uh, and well i hope uh, i can convince you that it is and then uh, data about the brain become really important and we can look uh, at uh, the brain so uh, that's what is uh, going to happen in the second part of this course what are we going to do today we'll start by introducing the mind-body pr problem um, that is we'll start by giving some characterization some initial classification of mental states so uh, preliminary characterization of what the mind is, the conscious mind is. Uh, so we have some idea what we're talking about uh, when we address this mind-body problem. So how does the conscious mind fit in the physical world? You need to have some idea of what we mean by the conscious mind. Uh, and then we'll look at uh, this mind-body problem and you'll immediately see that once we have this characterization of the mind, we have more than one problem. Um, and uh, then I briefly uh, present at the end of uh, that introduction an overview of the historical positions we're going to debate in this course and then the rest of this lecture is about substance dualism, Cartesian dualism. Uh, I'll explain what that is, what the problems are. Once we have an understanding of substance dualism and its problems, we can conclude what we should do uh, next. So. Uh, Today mainly is about substance dualism, but we start by giving you some idea of what the conscious mind is and what the mind-body problems are. Let's start by looking in more detail what the mind-body problem is. And when we do that, we also need to know what consciousness is. So in this part, of the lecture uh, we'll address question one what is the conscious mind so the question one basically is chapter one of the book we are using so let's start by a giving you a 
preliminary characterization and initial classification of what we mean by the conscious mind, what we mean by consciousness. So basically, there are three types of mental states. And states here refers to things. It could be events, could be processes, could be properties, could be actual uh, static states. So states usually mean something that is static and unchangeable. States here is just some variable. We're talking about mental entities, mental things. And in the literature, you see that most philosophers of mind use the word state, but a state could be anything. Uh, so we have uh, three types of mental things, mental states. So we have conscious experiences, we have cognitive states, and we have emotions. Um, so this in, is an initial classification. We might have to change that during the course of uh, uh, these lectures. And uh, maybe if you're going to do the cognitive neuroscience track, you'll see that uh, we have to make some adjustments uh, later as well. But this is a classical classification of the types of mental states that together form the conscious mind. So let's look a little bit in detail what we mean by that. So uh, conscious experiences, what are they? Uh, they are those mental states that have what it is likeness or uh, a quale. And the plural of quale is qualia. And when I was a student and did philosophy of mind first, I thought this was really problematic. There was no internet, so we couldn't look up what qualia were. Uh, we only had uh, our texts uh, uh, for that lecture, and it really was not clear. Um, so, a quale is another word for what's it likeness, and there are many debates on what all the properties of qualia uh, are. And one of the things to exp the one of the the, the 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 easiest way to explain it is well if you if you have a, a cup of coffee and you take a sip I now taste cold coffee and it's not as good as warm coffee I like my coffee hot even so um, but still it's better than um, well, gold tea. So I have a certain experience when I drink coffee and this can have different qualities. So it's better to drink hot coffee than cold coffee. It's a more, it's a nicer experience. So I would say it's a better quality, hence the name qualia and quale. Uh, and uh, experiencing cold coffee is better than uh, experiencing tea, whether the tea is hot or cold. That is what I believe. So it's a subjective experience. It's subjective. You might like, uh, you might dislike coffee anyway and say, well, it's tea for me. So it depends on you, what you uh, think is uh, better in quality uh, and that's the way you experience it uh, there might be people that say well I like my coffee cold that's a better that's a nicer experience than uh, my warm than warm coffee or hot coffee so uh, we call this what's it likeness what it is like to experience coffee cold coffee hot coffee tea uh, things like that and Nagel calls this what's it likeness. And he says, it is something it is like to bat. That's his way of explaining it. He says, if we stimulate, stimulate our senses, we have all these experiences. So it is something it is like to taste cold coffee. It is something it is like to, to, to taste uh, hot coffee. It is something it is like to taste Brussels sprouts. Um, it is something it is like to taste uh, licorice. Uh, it is something it is like to be you. So uh, that's different than uh, what it is like to be me. It is something it is like to be human. So we 
probably share all kinds of experiences uh, when we have all our senses stimulated. And Nagel says, well, we are very dissimilar from bats. Bats have a, a uh, sense we don't have. They have echolocation. And uh, assuming that animals also can have consciousness, then when the bat uses its echolocation, it has all kinds of experiences. So it is something it is like to experience echolocation, so just like it is something it is like to experience taste. Uh, use 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 your taste or use your uh, visual uh, senses, uh, visual sense, um, and it is something it is like to use echolocation. But well, can I explain that to you? No, because I don't know what it is like to be a bat. I don't know what it is like to use echolocation. Only the bat knows. So it's subjective. So we're talking about subjective experiences that have a certain quality to them. There's a certain degree of uh, pleasure or pain. So if you step onto a nail, that's not very nice. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, if, if you step onto a nail and you wear shoes, it might be just minor uh, pain, low in quality. But if you have a paper cut uh, on your fingertip, oh man, that's really that's really painful. That has more intense and uh, more intense quality. So these qualia differ, even though they are both uh, properties of the experience of pain. Okay, so that briefly is what uh, uh, conscious experiences are, and they can be distinguished distinguished from cognitive states cognitive mental states where you are aware of you you can think about something so the main example in philosophy are the propositional attitudes but here you just have to think when you think about cognition it's about thinking it's about having mental states that are about something that represent something so my thought about my mother represents my mother, my thought about my mother is about my mother. So uh, cognitive states have aboutness, as it's called, or in technical terms, it's intentionality. So that's, that's the technical term for mental states that are about something. So uh, if John looks outside and sees rain falling down, then John believes that it's raining, so John thinks that it's raining. And in philosophy, this, in many philosophy texts, this is called a propositional attitude. So John has a propositional attitude. So what's a propositional attitude? Well, it's an attitude towards a proposition. And on an exam, of course, that's not an explanation because you don't know anything uh, if you put it like that. So an attitude is a stance towards a proposition, and a proposition is the meaning of a sentence. So you have a sentence like the sentence, it's raining. And that means something. It means the same as the sentence het regent or es regent in Dutch and German. So those three sentences express the same proposition. They express the same meaning. And you can believe that. And that's a different stance from that you hope that it's raining or that you know that it's raining. So those are three different attitudes, three different stances you can have towards that proposition. So in this example, it is John believes that it's raining. So if you read texts about cognition, if you read philosophical texts about cognitive states, uh, in many cases, they will use a propositional attitude. And basically, it's a thought, right? So John believes that it's raining is John thinks that it's raining. So thinking, believing, hoping, uh, knowing that they're all attitudes you can have towards a proposition. And if you read about propositional attitudes, they are usually portrayed as discrete entities, as separate things. So they don't have influence on each other. That is, uh, they're just like marbles in a bucket. If you have marbles in a bucket, they're all discrete entities. They are separate things. And I can get one marble out of the bucket, throw it away, and it doesn't matter to the other marbles in the bucket. They still remain the same. So I can learn, for instance, that it's raining 
Now, I know that it's raining, so I have acquired a propositional attitude. That's one attitude, one propositional attitude more in my mind. Uh, and then I can forget that. And does that do anything uh, with respect to the belief I have that there is a cup of cold coffee on the table? No, it doesn't. It has no influence on that at all. That's, that's still a, uh, a belief I have. I believe there is a cup of cold coffee on the table. Uh, that's not influenced by having another propositional attitude or not. So they are discrete entities. They are separate in your mind. So it's like your mind has all kinds of conscious experiences and emotions and are all kinds of cognitive states. Any cognitive states, if they are propositional attitudes, they are separate. They have separate places in your mind, you could say, not influencing each other in a way that if you forget something or you learn something, that that has any influence on uh, the other propositional attitudes. This will become, of course, all this classification and this, this property of propositional attitudes being discrete entities become becomes relevant later. So these cognitive states are about something. So basically you can think of them as representations. Now, um, you can imagine that a computer also has internal states that are about something, that are representations. And I think many people uh, find it easy to uh, think of computers that have internal states that are about things out there, um, that those computers don't have any feelings, any experiences whatsoever. So you can have cognitive states without the qualia. So it might be conscious in the broad sense that it's that you're aware of something, that it's active. So we have all these uh, memories, for instance, and these memories, of course, are not conscious. You're not aware of them right now, uh, but you can become aware of them. And then you have, of course, a cognitive conscious state, but uh, that doesn't mean that you have a state that is that has a certain quality. So if we go back to the first one, Conscious experiences do have this qual qualia, do have these qualia, and cognitive states might not. So if you imagine a robot uh, with an artificial brain uh, that has mental states that are about something, they, you can easily imagine a, a robot stepping onto a nail that doesn't feel pain. So it doesn't have conscious experiences in the sense of having uh, mental states that have qualia. So you can separate them. Co cognitive states can exist without qualia. And the other way around, conscious experiences can um, exist without being about something. So if, if you uh, close your eyes and, and lightly press your eyes, then you, uh, if, you're, if you're like me, then uh, you'll see all kinds of colors kind of shapes but do I really think they represent something out there in the world no they're just they're just the experiences that feel a certain way uh, sometimes they're beautiful and sometimes they're not uh, so they have a different uh, they have different qualitative aspects they have different phenomenology so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about conscious experiences we're talking about phenomenal consciousness the way we experience it uh, and subconscious experiences or experiences uh, can exist at least at the conceptual level uh, without being about something and cognitive states can be about something without having qualia and that takes us then to emotions because emotions both have a qualitative character both have a quality and about this and intentionality so suppose you're in traffic and someone is uh, looking at their uh, mobile phone and is uh, sending text messages to someone uh, while he or she is driving uh, you will be angry at that person so that has a qualitative 
character, it is something it is like to be angry. But, well, you're also angry about something, about the behavior uh, of uh, this, this, this really bad driver. Um, so that's always a combination. And the emotion is always a combination of these two. If you say, well, I'm, I'm really angry. Well, then someone asks, well, why? And why are you angry? What are you angry about? So you immediately get this about question. Uh, no, I'm just angry. Okay, that's strange. Then there's something wrong with you. Um, okay, so we have these three types of mental states and that is an initial classification. So what does that mean? That means that we might have to revise it later a little. So one thing, that's, and that's why I pressed it when I talked about the cognitive states, is that, well, maybe we have to rethink our ideas about cognitive states being propositional attitudes, that is, being mental states that are discrete entities, like marbles in a bucket. Uh, so already in this course, we will adjust this initial, this classical classification. We will adjust that a little bit. And well, uh, you probably learn more about the mind and the brain in if you do the cognitive neuroscience track. And then uh, you'll learn uh, more details uh, and you'll probably get a more nuanced, more sophisticated uh, view on the different mental types. So this is an introductory course. We have to start somewhere. We want to think about all the different answers to the question, how the mind fits in the physical world. And therefore we need to have some idea of what we mean when we say mind or conscious mind. So you, you get, uh, if you do the cognitive neuroscience track, you get uh, a psychology of language. So, uh, there you're going to think about representations. And of course, I already said something about representations. Cognitive states are about something. So basically there are representational states, there are thoughts. Do we think in language? Do we think in movies, in images? Uh, I think there are, there are interesting questions. So if you think about language uh, and what language is and how that works in the mind, uh, I think you learn more about the mind. So uh, if you do a cognitive neuroscience track, uh, you probably get more sophisticated ideas about that. The same goes for emotions. You'll get uh, a, a course, if you do the cognitive neuroscience track, you get a course on the emotional brain. Uh, you're going to study a really good book by uh, and, and text about uh, uh, Joseph Ledoux. Uh, really interesting if you're interested in cognitive neuroscience and emotions. So uh, I think this is a book well chosen by uh, Emil and Martijn. Um, those are the lectures. Uh, so, and then you'll get a more sophisticated view of what emotions are. So we now just say emotions are mental states that have a quality, that feel a certain way, and that uh, have intentionality that are about something. And maybe, well, probably in all likelihood, when you learn more, you'll get a more sophisticated view on what emotions are. If you read that book by Ledoux and also his later work, because this is a good book, but he also wrote uh, um, more recently about emotions and he, he adjusted uh, his, his views. So that's interesting to see that this is a field of study that is uh, in, in terms of uh, Lakatos progressive uh, research program. Uh, so things are happening even within uh, the ideas of uh, an expert like uh, Joseph Ledoux. He's changing his views on what emotions are and uh, how to think about emotions. And if you do a course on that, uh, you get really a better uh, uh, idea of what emotions are. And you get a better idea of yourself because you're an emotional being, of course. Okay, uh, now we have these three mental types making up our conscious minds. 
let's look at a mind-body problem now, because that has an implication that we have three different uh, mental types for our question. So our general problem is, how does the conscious mind fit in the physical world? Then we have conscious experiences, we have cognitive states, and when you're aware of them, when you entertain them, they are conscious in that sense, and we have emotions. So how does the mind fit in the physical world? How does the conscious mind fit in the physical world? Well, basically we have these three types of mental states make, making up the conscious mind. So basically we have three sub-problems. How do conscious experience fit in the physical world? How do uh, cognitive states fit in the physical world? And how do emotions fit in the physical world? So we're just starting by trying to explain uh, how we could think about the mind, what worth an initial classification is, and already we have multiplied our uh, problem. I'll make it more different because maybe conscious experience, the answer to how conscious experience fit in the physical world is different from the answer to the question how cognitive states fit in the physical world. Maybe those are two different problems. It could be that it's the same that is the same problem, that they are related to the physical world in the same way, but it could also be that that's not the case. And emotions might fit in the physical world in yet another way. And now I hope you see that, well, this last thing might not be so obvious. So what you could try to do is try to focus on the properties of these mental states. So we've seen conscious experiences are characterized by having qualia and emotions have qualia as well. Cognitive states are characterized by having aboutness or intentionality and emotions have intentionality as well. So instead of having two, uh, sorry, having three questions pertaining to the mental states, we could also look at the properties they have and then ask the questions about the properties because if you know how qualia fit in the physical world that might be different from how intentionality fits in the physical world but if emotions have both qualia and intentionality you might have answered the question how emotion fits in the physical world once you have answer the question how qualia fit in the physical world, so how conscious experiences fit in the physical world, and how intentionality fits in the physical world, so how cognitive states fit in the physical world. So let's focus on that. That's what they usually do in philosophy of mind. Uh, most, the most problematic question is the first one, and the one that seems to be solvable uh, by contemporary science, we'll see that in a later lecture, is the second one. The qualia problem seems to be the real hard problem of consciousness. Okay, so we can reduce the three problems to two problems, still we have two problems. And the question is, of course, what are the different answers that have been given in history, in the history of thinking about the mind uh, to these questions? So what are the possible positions in this mind-body debate, this debate of how the mind fits in a physical world, how it's related to the physical body. So this is a historical overview and the reason for that I just explained but again the reason for that is if I started by explaining our contemporary views you might wonder how we got there and uh, it's always good to look at the history at the development of ideas about something so you understand our contemporary ideas about it. So if we think about the mind and how it fits in the physical world, it's good to think, to look back and see how people have thought about that in, uh, well, uh, other uh, times, like in the 17th century, we'll start with that. Um, okay, how did people think then and you'll see that might be more in line with your intuitions but it's also then you also see if we look at it in more detail that if your intuition is that that position is right then you might find out that your intuition is wrong because this view really is problematic and we have recognized in thinking about the mind uh, in the history of thinking about the mind we have recognized these problems and we didn't stick with that even though substance dualism might be 
intuitively very plausible. Uh, if you look at it, it isn't. And then we'll change. We'll see that people tried idealism. So substance dualism tells us that the mind and the body are two different things, two different substances that can exist independent of each other. And that's problematic. And then someone tried, uh, some philosophers, scientists tried idealism. Maybe, maybe there is just the mind and the physical world does exist, but is in some way dependent for its existence on a mind. Uh, and then we'll see that's problematic. So that's basically what we do, right? We'll I'll introduce an historical answer to the question, how the mind fits in the physical world. Then we evaluate that. And usually this evaluation leads to a new view because the new view tries to solve the problems that uh, were clear in the evaluation of the previous uh, answer. So idealism clearly tries to solve a problem of substance dualism. Uh, the question is, does it do that? Is it successful in solving that problem? Uh, well, probably uh, you'll understand that the answer is no, because then uh, we might have stuck with idealism and we haven't. So there is this view of behaviorism uh, that's really science driven and uh, it claims that the mind is behavior. We'll evaluate that and see that uh, the identity theory or reductionism might be an improvement of that, might be a better research program in terms of Imre Lagatos. Uh, we'll also have to take a look at eliminativism. That is not a position that is generally accepted by anyone, uh, uh, by, by a lot of, uh, in, in, in history, there were never people uh, really uh, in large numbers accepting that. But uh, there is some argument to be made that there actually is no mind. So that goes against the assumption we had, uh, uh, we have made at the beginning of uh, this lecture. Uh, we'll have to address that uh, as well. And then we look at functionalism and connectionism. Both views claim that mental states uh, can also uh, be uh, present in artificial systems, for instance. And we can actually make them. Uh, we'll look at that and see whether that is indeed true and uh, it works. And with connectionism, we'll enter uh, the contemporary debate on how the mind fits in the physical world. Connectionism. Uh, claims that mental states are states in a neural uh, network, could also be an artificial neural network, it clearly focuses on the brain. And then we look at the embodied and embedded mind. That means we're looking at the relevance of the, uh, of the body and the environment, the situation the body that has this mind uh, is in. Uh, so there seems to be uh, more to the mind than just the brain. Uh, the question, of course, is, is how relevant that all is. And we'll also look there at the extended mind, that is, if we look at cognition only, not, not at uh, qualia, then uh, you might argue that a notebook uh, is part of the cognitive mind. That's a thought experiment to get uh, uh, you thinking about uh, your own views on uh, the uh, the mind and its place in nature and also in the last lecture we'll uh, address all kinds of thought experiments also to to uh, see whether uh, the mind can be studied scientifically uh, but also to uh, look at your intuitions and evaluate those so that at the end of the mind part you'll also have uh, are, are ready to develop your own ideas about the mind and how it fits in the physical world. So these are all tools. These are all, uh, so it's basically just uh, a presentation of the different answers to the question, how the mind fits in the physical world. Just so that if you start to think about that, if you think about that, uh, you have all these knowledge of these different views and their problems. So you don't have to invent all these views yourself.
The first view we will discuss is that of substance dualism. It's an old view. It's still, at least in society, uh, a view that many people have, but in science it's basically uh, a view that nobody accepts. This is about question two. Can the mind function separately from the brain, from the body? The answer of the substance dualist is yes, it can. One of the most important views in the mind-body debate, one of the most important positions in the mind-body debate is that of substance dualism, or dualism for short. Usually when we're talking about dualism, we mean substance dualism, so we leave substance out. Uh, and substance dualism uh, basically claims that there are two substances, hence dualism, and a substance is that, can which, that, that which can exist on its own. So it doesn't need anything else to exist. Well, what are the two substances? Those are the res cogitans, the thinking substance. So it's a substance that can think, and that's just a thing that can exist on its own. It doesn't need anything else to exist. So it doesn't need the physical world, for instance, because the physical world, physical stuff, there is a, a physical substance as well uh, that has extensa in Latin, and that's the physical or the extended substance, and uh, having extension means having three dimensions. Uh, so um, uh, having uh, a place in space, a location in space. And that too is a substance, there's a physical substance, so the physical world doesn't need the mental world to exist, doesn't need the thinking world to exist. So basically that's not the to Difficult, I think. You, if I think, if we are thinking about a rock or something like that, we we have well, say a rock has a place in space. It has three dimensions, so it's a physical thing. It is extended, uh, but we don't think rocks have minds. So if you don't think rocks have minds, you believe that rocks can exist on their own. They don't need a mental entity, mental substance to exist. The other way around is a little bit more difficult, but I think in society we don't have really a problem understanding that because we're talking about ghosts or souls or something like that. Something that's not physical but, but can think and feel, etc. and can exist without that physical world. Uh, and the main proponent of this view was René Descartes. So uh, René Descartes also gave his name to this substance dualism. We also call this Cartesian dualism, Cartesian substance dualism. So um, Descartes lived in the Netherlands. He wrote uh, most of his books here. Um, he, uh, I think he was a brilliant uh, philosopher and scientist, uh, but he was quite wrong in many things. And, uh, in many things he was right. But his physics, for instance, uh, well, has has elements that uh, we still use. Basically, he has mechanized uh, a worldview. So, uh, or he's one of the philosophers and scientists that uh, did that. So that means that we can describe uh, the physical world using laws. And if you accept that, uh, like Newton did, then you can look for those laws. Uh, you are going to use mathematical descriptions. He was a great mathematician and um, much of his mathematics still holds. So he um, uh, came up with the idea of uh, the X and uh, the Y axis. So if you ever had trouble studying uh, mathematics uh, and that part of mathematics, well, it's due to him, but also due to him, we have uh, applied mathematics uh, in many cases that actually improved the world. Uh, but I believe in his philosophy of mind, he was uh, wrong, but still it is important because I think in society, many people, if not most, still are dualists or substance dualists or in some sense, Cartesian dualists. Uh, so it's a quite an intuitive uh, view of the mind body, the mind world relationship.
Okay, so um, you've seen René Descartes in uh, the Thinking About Science course, and what we'll see in this course is that many of the philosophers slash scientists that were thinking about knowledge were also thinking about the mind-body problem. So uh, he's definitely not the only one we'll encounter in this course that you've seen in uh, the Thinking About Science uh, course. So let's look at his project and then see how we get to his uh, philosophy of mind. So Descartes was basically interested in a lot of things. He was interested in mathematics. He was interested in physics. He was interested in medicine. So that was one of his main interests, I believe. He was trying to improve medicine uh, because, well, um, medicine in his days was not that far advanced. Uh, of course, they already discovered a lot of things, but uh, they didn't know anything about uh, bacteria or viruses, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and basically, they didn't know much of the causes of many diseases. So much of the methods to cure those diseases were, well, not cures at all and probably made things worse. So if you, uh, uh, if you uh, can open your arm to let blood out uh, because you think that gets rid of, well, bad stuff, then you probably become weaker and have run more risk of dying. And Descartes already knew that. Descartes was really not uh, a big fan of uh, uh, bloodletting. Uh, he only did that with himself just before he died as a last uh, resort to try to uh, cure his uh, pneumonia, basically. He's pr he probably died in Stockholm of uh, pneumonia. Uh, and of course, bloodletting will not uh, work then. Um, so he was interested in many things, but he wanted real knowledge. So uh, he was looking for knowledge, but real knowledge. And then you need a foundation for your epistemology, for your science, for your knowledge that you cannot doubt. So the metaphor for uh, well, all your knowledge together is a building. So he has a foundation and then you build the rest of your knowledge on your foundation and you have to be sure about your foundation. So you have to be 100% sure that you have justified and true beliefs because if not, if your foundation is rotten, your knowledge building will collapse in the end. So he is looking for a foundation you cannot doubt. And of course he is in debate with uh, skeptics that say you can't know anything at all especially Michel de Montaigne who says well if you have a belief you have arguments in favor for it and you also have arguments against it so if you put them on a scale this scale will be in balance and you can't make a decision about your belief whether it's true or not so you should abstain from making any judgments about the world basically abstain from claiming that any of your beliefs is a justified and true belief is knowledge so Descartes says, well, okay, that's the one, that, that's the, 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 the uh, person I'm in, or, or they, those are the persons I'm debating, the skeptics. Uh, so what can I be absolutely sure about? In other words, do I have a belief that I cannot doubt? So what's the source of knowledge? Where, where do I get beliefs that I believe to be justified and true, that I can show to be justified and true? Because your beliefs, you have all kinds of beliefs, Descartes had all kinds of beliefs, and he said, well, uh, I believe I have a body and there are all human beings and there is snow and that people get ill and I want to know why they get ill. Um, so he's trying to find knowledge, but of course he, is also, he has also beliefs, and a belief is a mental state of which you think that it's true, but it might be false. And even if it's true, you might not actually know that it's true. So you're looking for a justification, an explanation that uh, explains how you actually know that, you're just, that your belief is justified, that uh, it actually is knowledge. So can you trust your teachers? Because if you have a source of knowledge that you cannot trust, that you basically doubt whether it generates true, uh, justified or true beliefs, then you should not trust that 
uh, source. And he went to um, a school in La Flèche, um, a very good school, uh, but very Aristotelian. <laughs> so, uh, and he, he was a smart guy, so he pretty soon found out that not everything they told about uh, by the, the world, based on Aristotle's beliefs, um, was true. Aristotle wasn't right in everything. And Descartes found that out, so he says, well, my teachers do really believe that Aristotle was right. Uh, they told me all kinds of things about the world, but uh, clearly Aristotle was wrong, and hence my teachers were wrong. They weren't lying, but they were telling falsehoods. So they were honest. Uh, they were not aware that they were wrong. So we're not liars. Uh, so there's a difference between, between not telling the truth and lying. And he says, well, they were not lying, but they weren't telling the truth either. So uh, I don't know that I can trust them. So because they were wrong in certain with certain things, and maybe they were also wrong in, in, with the other things they told me, which I actually might believe that they are true. But I can't say that I can justify those beliefs by referring to my teachers because my teachers have told me things that were wrong in other occasions. Okay, so teachers cannot be used to um, justify your uh, beliefs. Can you use observation? So here he's looking at empiricism, right? So empiricists will say, if I look at the world, I observe things, uh, I have all kinds of experiences when I do that. Uh, and uh, that can be seen as a foundation of knowledge. So I take a sip of my coffee, I observe that it is, well, lukewarm uh, by now. Uh, well, I have this experience and I can show, I am absolutely sure about what I experience. So that's a, a foundation you can be sure of. So that's good in Empiricism, you can be absolutely sure about your experiences. So if, to give another example, if you have a toothache, you're pretty sure you have a toothache, that you have this experience of a toothache. However, does that imply that you actually have uh, something wrong with one of your teeth? I don't know. You might not even have a physical body. We'll get to that in a moment, but you might not have a physical body. So you do have the experience, but you might live in a virtual reality. I might live in a virtual reality and there is no coffee. I, I'm absolutely sure that I have this experience of uh, lukewarm coffee, but that doesn't mean that there actually is lukewarm coffee. So if I believe that there is lukewarm coffee in my cup, then this belief might be true, but I don't know, because if I base this on my experience, that's not enough. I might live in a virtual reality. So observation also fails. Descartes gives, gives different, different examples, but basically that's what it is. Your senses can deceive you. So take, take a, uh, a, uh, a visual illusion. You've all seen pictures that at first sight seem to move, but if you look closer and you focus on one part of the picture, you'll see that it isn't moving at all. Um, it's actually a picture and not a movie. Uh, still, if you look at it, you have this experience of movement, but this experience doesn't correspond to uh, the facts in the world. And you can pretty, pretty easily establish that thus your senses have deceived you, at least in one of the two cases when you experience the movement or when you see, when you focus on one part of the picture, that it's not moving in either, in one of these cases or in both, your senses must be deceiving you, must have de deceived you. And same with the teachers. Once you have found a source of knowledge that you cannot trust, it's not actually a source of knowledge anymore. So your observation cannot be a source of knowledge. So then he asks, the reader to, to, to perform this thought experiment, right? So basically he's going in the direction of, of the virtual reality argument. So he, uh, as I said, he was uh, uh, schooled at La Flèche. Uh, his teachers were Jesuits, so they were Christians. So we have six days to work and a seven day 
to rest. And here, uh, in, in this theory, this is philosophy, his philosophy of, uh, of knowledge, his epistemology, but also his uh, philosophy of mind. He, he, amongst others, wrote that down in the meditations. And there are six meditations, six chapters, of course, one for each day, and then the seventh day you rest. So this is of this is from the first meditation. And the meditation is written in the meditations are written in, in a certain way that he invites the reader of the meditation to actually meditate upon it. So to uh, make the argument your own. So he asks, okay, so do you trust your teachers? And you should According to Descartes, say no, because my teachers once had told uh, things that were not true. So how can I be how can I be certain that they are telling the truth uh, in things I do believe uh, they were actually telling the truth? I can't trust them there. Uh, the same with my senses. And now he says, okay, so I'm sitting here by the fire writing this book, and you might be sitting in the sun reading the book. Um, and then the question is, are you awake? So he says, I might be dreaming I'm writing this book, and he might, and, and you might think, I might be dreaming reading this book. Or in this case, you might be dreaming watching this movie. And that would imply that your physical body is not uh, sitting in the sun in, in the park uh, reading the book, or sitting in uh, uh, in a building watching uh, a laptop and Descartes, uh, his physical body uh, was in his bed and not in uh, his living room near the fireplace. But then he asks the question, well, I might not even have a body. Do you have a body? Are you sure about that? Because you might be dreaming all this, but who says you need a body to dream? You just need a mind. And he even goes so far and he says, well, what else are you, do you think you know is a belief you're very sure of, but might be, but might be false. He says, does two and two equal four? Are you sure? As I said, he was a great mathematician. So he was looking into mathematical problems, really difficult mathematical problems and try, he tried to solve them. And he says, I have thought in previous times that I've solved that I solved a really really difficult mathematical problem and it turned out I didn't so I was wrong and he admits that and he says well but how then do I know that two and two equal four equals four because it seems an easy problem but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is also a difficult mathematical problem and I just didn't see it. Two and two, I think it equals four. It's pretty straightforward, but it might be uh, nine and three quarters. I don't know. So it might be wrong there. And then he goes on and with, with his uh, thought experiment, his, his method of radical doubt, basically not his own method, but the method of the skeptic, of course, what, what you can what you can doubt is not a justified and true belief, cannot be knowledge. So what if there is an evil demon, a malagini? What if there is an all-powerful evil demon that basically what we would now say creates a virtual reality? So it, he creates a world that in which he tricks you to believe you are watching this movie. Because I, I do believe you actually do believe that. The question is, is it knowledge? <laughs> so you're watching this movie. Well, you can doubt that because there might be a virtual reality created by an evil, all powerful demon in which there is not even a physical world. So your mind is in this virtual reality. You might not even have a body Two and two might not even equal four. So now there's not much left of your prior beliefs. So if you have beliefs based on books and things you have learned from your teachers and parents, uh, you can't trust that. So all those beliefs, at least for the moment, cannot be classified as knowledge. Um, 
all kind of common sense beliefs you have acquired by using your senses. You can't trust them. So those beliefs cannot be classified as knowledge. Even mathematical truths, that is, beliefs you think are true about mathematics, mathematics they can't, you can't accept them as true because you might be wrong there. There might even be an evil demon tricking you in believing all these things are true while actually they are false. And then he comes up with one, most, uh, with one of the most famous slogans in uh, uh, Western philosophy, cogito ergo sum. This is called the cogito. Cogito ergo sum means I think, therefore I am. And what he did, he says, okay, so I'm doubting everything. And now I might only be a mind being uh, deceived by some evil demon, even being deceived in thinking that two and two equals four. But, so does that mean that I, I don't know anything? No, I do know one thing because he says, I have to exist. Why is that something he is absolutely sure of? Well, he says, if I doubt my own existence, then I think I might not exist. So I'm thinking that I might not exist. I'm doubting. So if I doubt, I'm thinking. Thinking is, uh, doubting is a form of thinking. So if I think I might not exist, I have to exist because how else can I think at all, right? So I think, therefore I am. And now we see that he has, his, his, he has found his foundation. So he has this metaphor of knowledge as a building the foundation has to be solid, you have to be 100% certain, it, it can't be rotten, because then your building will collapse, and now we know something is absolutely sure of. You cannot doubt your own existence. I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. So that's his foundation. But that's not much, right? So now there is an evil demon, uh, there might be an evil demon, uh, and, well, if there's an evil demon, there is no use in me telling you all this because then I'm just telling the evil demon that, not you. Your creations of uh, the evil demon from my perspective, and I am a creation of the evil demon from your perspective. So, how to proceed? The court says, I think, therefore I am. So he is, he exists. So he is, but what is he? And then he says, well, <laughs> I'm a thinking thing. And res cogito is a thinking substance. And so, as I said, a substance is something that can exist on its own. And according to Descartes, there are two, two, there are two and here is one, the, the thinking substance. Strictly speaking, Descartes would argue in different locations that God is the only real substance. So a substance that can exist on its own. Uh, only God really is a substance, but uh, other than God, uh, the thinking substance and later the physical substance do not have anything, uh, do not need anything to exist. So uh, here he is just in the meditations, he's just writing about uh, substance dualism with respect to uh, the thinking and the physical substance. So what is the essential property of the substance, the defining property of this substance? Well, that is thinking. And to be sure, thinking in Cartesian terms uh, means also experiencing. So when we make this distinction between uh, conscious experiences, cognitive states and emotions, they all are categorized under thinking uh, in Cartesian uh, philosophy. So if I taste the coffee, uh, this experience I have uh, also is part of thinking. So basically thinking just refers to any mental state in uh, Cartesian philosophy. So how does he know that I think therefore I am is true? every time he thinks that. How does he know that that's true while he doesn't know, for the moment, that two and two equals four or that there is a physical world? 
Well, he says, this is a clear and distinct insight. It's not confused. I can, don't confuse it with anything else. Uh, it's very clear. It's a clear cognitive perception, you could say. And then he says, okay, so I see this with my rational mind, with my reason. So hence, he is a rationalist, uh, defending that the source of knowledge is the ratio and not, for instance, your observation as an empiricist would claim. So he's, he says, I see this with my ratio, with my reason, with my uh, with the cognitive part of my mind. So he says, it's a clear and distinct insight. And now you see that he has found a second method uh, in his quest for knowledge. So he started off with having all kinds of beliefs about the world, about himself. And then he says, well, the skeptic says, I do not know anything, or maybe not even that. Montaigne didn't even say, I do not know anything, because that would already be a knowledge claim. He just asked the question, what do I know? And a question has no true value. A question is not true or false. You don't claim to have any knowledge if you ask a question. So Descartes says, I'm using this method of my opponent, the skeptic, the method of radical doubt, and I see whether anything of my old beliefs can be classified as knowledge. And then he finds this cogito ergo sum, this, this truth that if he thinks he has to exist each time that he's thinking that. But that's really the bottom, really, really the, the foundation. That's the only thing he knows. And then he says, how do I know this? Oh, I know this because I see this clearly and distinctly. Ah, and now we have a switch. Instead of breaking down his former building of beliefs, breaking everything down that's not knowledge, he now has a method that he says, okay, so anything that I see clearly and distinctly, so it's a uh, rationalistic, rationalist method, Anything he sees clearly and distinctly has to be true. So the clear and distinct insight functions as a justification for his true beliefs. And then he can say, ah, now I have knowledge. So he has knowledge that he has to exist every time he, uh, he thinks, I think, therefore I am. So now he has a proper method to start building again, not just demolishing his previous building of, well, beliefs, not even, might not even be knowledge. It might be knowledge. So in the end, Descartes, of course, goes back to the same building and he says, well, now I know that my beliefs are true. So he says, okay, so, so I have now a rational uh, method to gain knowledge, to acquire knowledge, to justify certain beliefs. And, well, I think he, it then goes wrong, but let's see what he does and uh, how he then gets to his philosophy of mind and how his philosophy of mind and his epistemology uh, uh, are intertwined. So he says, I find this concept in my mind of God. So this concept of God, I see that in my mind. And part of this concept is that it tells me that God is absolutely perfect. And he then says, I'm not perfect. So how did I ever get this concept? It has to come from something that is as perfect <laughs> as is entailed in this notion of God who is absolutely perfect. So there has to be some absolutely perfect being. Well, that of course is God. So this is one of his proofs of the existence of God. And he says, I see this clearly and distinctly, hence it has to be true. If you don't buy this, you're, well, in good company, because I think most people, at least these days, will not accept this proof for the existence of God, or at least of an all-powerful, all-perfect being. And he calls that God, of course. 
And he also sees that clearly and distinctly that in deceit there is imperfection. Since God is perfect, he has no imperfection, so God is not deceitful, God is not evil, God is good. And now he is basically, and he also says, I see this clearly and distinctly, so it is knowledge. So, so he says, I think therefore I am, that I know absolutely with 100% certainty. And now he also knows that God exists and that God is good. And he also sees it clearly and distinctly. Um, and that is, is uh, uh, then his way of getting rid of the evil demon. Because as long as the evil demon is in our thought experiment, then two and two might not even equal four. There might not be a physical world. And if there's no physical world, well, anything you believe about that physical world is uh, not knowledge. So God is good and God, uh, God, God exists and God is good. And that means that he doesn't deceive me, at least not all the time. So God basically doesn't deceive me, but made me in such a way that if I do not use my ratio properly, I'll make mistakes about the world. So this means that in some sense, you are responsible for using your own ratio properly. And if you don't, and you make mistakes, and you make moral or ethical mistakes, you are responsible for that yourself. Even though God, of course, knows that you will not use your ratio properly at a certain given time. And of course, then you get in all kinds of uh, theological problems and problems about free will and stuff like that. So we leave that. <laughs> That's for, for another day. Uh, but uh, that was a problem in uh, Cartesian times, of course, when they were thinking that God was good and God was all powerful and knew everything. And well, does that then imply that God made you and if you do something bad that God created evil? Okay, because God is, of course, good and not evil. So if God is responsible for evil, isn't he evil? Okay. Let's leave that. So there is room for ethics in uh, those times. There is room for ethics in Cartesian philosophy because of you making mistakes. But that would be mistakes when you do not use your ratio properly. And it's not due to God. God does not deceive me. So if I have concepts that refer to the physical world, then God will not be so deceitful that uh, he, he has me believe that there is a physical world. I might be make mistakes about something in the physical world, but not about everything, because then, because then God would have deceived me in thinking there's a physical world while there actually isn't. Then he would be an evil demon and not a good demon. So. God does not deceive me, and that means that the that uh, most of my concepts about the physical world, like the concepts that refer to my my own body, uh, they refer to something that's real. So I am also a body. I'm also a physical thing. This body has three dimensions. Uh, it has a the essential property is that it is extended, so that is just that it has three. Um, uh, dimensions. So that is uh, what is also referred to in the res extensa, the extended thing uh, in Latin. So, and he gives this, he does this thought experiment of showing that indeed of a physical thing, the essential property, the property that doesn't change uh, is that it takes a uh, space a place in space. So he says, I, I'm writing this book near the um, near the fire, and on the table near the fire is a piece of wax, uh, straight from the beehive, and it has a certain smell, and I can taste it. It has a certain taste, and I put it on the table, and uh, it, I also see it has a certain color and a certain shape, and uh, so uh, I perceive all these properties. And now I'm writing, I'm writing about God and that he exists, etc., etc., etc. Oh, and I look back at the wax and, uh, well, it, the, the, 
the warmth of the fire, the heat of the fire has changed it. It's molten now. It's still wax, but it tastes different if I, if I taste it. Uh, it smells different. The color is slightly changed. Uh, so all kinds of properties have changed, but what uh, hasn't changed and it is that it still takes up place in space. It still has three dimensions. So it is extended. So any physical object has three dimensions. Okay, so now he says, I am both a physical substance and a mental substance. And now, of course, we get to the mind-body problem because basically he says, yeah, <laughs> I have a mind and there is a physical world. And now the question, of course, is how does the mind fit in the physical world? How are they related? And they seem to be related because if I want to take a sip of coffee, really cold coffee by now, my body does that. If my mental substance wants to do that, my physical body uh, does do that. So how does this work? How does this interaction work? Because there is interaction. And if my physical body takes a sip, then I have this experience, which is part of thinking of the, the way uh, Descartes uh, classifies mental states. So it is a mental state. So there is influence from the physical substance to the mental substance and the other way around. But how can that be? What's the problem? Well, these days we would say there's the causal closure of the physical world. No energy gets in or out of the system. Uh, Descartes didn't have that. Uh, basically, he says, well, every every event so that goes that's prior to the causal closure argument we have these days. Every physical event has a physical cause. And the physical cause seem to be sufficient to explain the physical event. You don't need to have anything else. It is really unintelligible. So the, the idea is that movement in the physical world, according to Descartes, is caused by physical particles, physical things colliding. So uh, if you have a billiard ball and you would like to put another billiard ball at that location, well, they can't both be at the same location at the same time. So you have to push that one away. So there is a collision, there is push, and that moves the other billiard ball. So movement in the physical world is generated by physical objects colliding with each other, pushing against each other. And of course they can push because they all have three dimensions. They all take up place in space. And then, well, if you want to take another object's place, then you have to push it away. And that's how movement is caused. And do I then need any other causes? No, I don't. And the problem, furthermore, is that I've called this the Patrick Swayze problem from uh, the movie Ghost, where Patrick Swayze plays a ghost, a soul, a entity that is only a, uh, a mental substance and not a physical substance and he would really like he died he was a young guy and he had a girlfriend and he wants to interact with his uh, girlfriend again uh, he wants to let her know for instance that he is well his soul is still there uh, but how can he do that how can he push because he is not extended He's just soul, and the essential property of the soul, of the physical, uh, sorry, of the uh, of the mental substance, is that it thinks. And Descartes is re really clear there. It does not have uh, extension. It does not have a place in space. It has no dimensions. It's not three-dimensional. So the problem is, and that's the problem Patrick Tracy had, how do I interact with the world as merely a ghost how do i if i am both a mental substance and a physical substance how how do i being the mental substance interact with my body 
how do I make all these movements? My mind can't push because it doesn't take up a place in space. It's not extended. So that's the interaction problem in Cartesian uh, philosophy. You have this epistemological project. It starts with how do I know something about the world? And he ends up with saying, well, there is this mental substance and a physical substance and they do interact. And OK, so once he has established the existence of God and that God is good, he can do proper research in the physical world again. He was interested, for instance, in uh, the, the shape of uh, snowflakes. So why are uh, they the shape they are? Why are they flat, for instance? Why are all snowflakes flat? He didn't know that, they didn't know that, so he was looking for an answer to that. And of course, looking for an answer, looking to gain knowledge, to acquire knowledge about the physical world only makes sense if you can say, well, I really know without a doubt uh, that there is a physical world. It's a justified and true belief. I have knowledge. And so the moment he has um, proven the existence of the good God, he has a way to gain knowledge about the physical world he has established that there is a physical world and then he could do his science but he also has created his problem because at that moment he said well there is this mental substance and a physical substance and apparently they do interact but i can't explain this and well that's a problem so he was thinking about that uh amongst other reasons, uh, was that he was corresponding with uh, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Uh, so they met in uh, The Hague in the Netherlands, where she lived in exile uh, because, well, her father tried to uh, become uh, the, the king of uh, Bohemia. Um, uh, he was already the king of the Pfalz. Uh, and, well, the, uh, he got kicked out of Bohemia by the um, the emperor, and he fled to the Netherlands where he because he was well he was related to uh, the the Orange uh, family, uh, so uh, he uh, got they got to live here. Uh, Elizabeth basically lived with the mother because her father uh, died shortly after that, uh, so they lived in exile. And uh, Descartes visited her, and well. Long story short, she had to leave uh, the Netherlands and uh, then they started a correspondence or they already had started that, but then uh, it really got uh, uh, going and they wrote uh, many letters to each other. And in one of the letters, she asks him about his, uh, about his interaction problem. So how can the soul of man being only a thinking substance determine that is causally interact with his bodily spirits to perform voluntary actions. So the bodily spirits, that sounds to us like, wait a minute, the bodily spirits, that sounds like mental entities because spirits in, in our uh, uh, interpretation might refer to a spirit like a ghost. And here spirits just refers to really tiny physical particles. So that's just a word they used. How can the soul thus interact with all these uh, tiny particles so basically the idea is that in your in your blood vessels there are all these tiny physical particles bumping e against each other making all the movement possible so if here are all kinds of if there is a flow of tiny particles then uh, uh, then they push to, uh, against each other and then my uh, my hand opens for instance something like that but if I want if my mind wants to open my hand how, how how does that work where does the mind push against these particles that push against each other and in the end cause me to open or my body to open my hand how does that work because the mind goes right through it it has no it has no three dimensions how does this work so she writes this to Descartes and Descartes usually was very um, 
uh, well, not very nice to his critics. If you read his letters, uh, he usually says to uh, people having criticism uh, that they are stupid in a slightly nicer way, but not very much nicer. And in the end, Descartes has to admit that he doesn't know. He says, clearly we are a mental substance and clearly, uh, I see this clearly and distinctly, we are a physical substance and clearly they interact. But I cannot understand how they can interact because they have such different properties that I, or we human beings, are unable to think both things at the same time. We are unable to think them as two really distinct substances that also interact. Because clearly they interact. I can pick up the cup, the empty cup. I can pick that up with my body. And why do I do that? Well, because I wanted to do that. So my mind caused my body to do that. And if I pick up the cup, there are signals go from my body to my mind. I feel and I see that I type the cup. So, but my mind, the theory, doesn't allow for that. Or at least it doesn't make intelligible how a non-physical thing can push and that's 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 the most uh, clear problem here how can something that cannot push push <laughs> well the court says apparently that's the case that the mind is able to move the physical body and maybe in a different way than actually pushing uh, i don't know how that could work he says i i just don't know what he says he does know is that mind and brain mind and the physical world mind and body are connected in the pineal gland so a small gland in between uh the two hemispheres of the brain and he says uh i i believe because uh, if i have two eyes and uh, I look at the world, or have two arms and touch things, touch the table, and say, okay, I see the table. I get input from two systems, the left hand and the right hand, the left eye and the right eye, and somehow they have to come together to be perceived as one thing in the human mind. And he says, it seems to come together from the both hemispheres in this pineal gland in between, and there it interacts with the mind so the mind can perceive the stimuli we would now say and uh, sees one picture or feels one picture of uh, the world but of course pointing out where the inter where the interaction uh, uh, takes place is no solution to how the interaction takes place so um, in the pineal gland there are all, all these particles these animal spirits flowing through that and there, apparently, the, uh, that's the best place for the mind to interact uh, with those uh, particles. How we don't know. Descartes, being a good Christian, uh, Elizabeth also being a good Christian, Descartes being a Catholic, um, Elizabeth being a Protestant, he says, well, God takes care of the interaction. He could have made us in such a way that if you uh, step into a nail, you wouldn't feel pain, but the taste of chocolate. But he didn't. And he says, God takes care of the interaction, and I don't know how. So, uh, in the end, uh, he has to admit to uh, Elizabeth, well, you're right. Um, I don't know how it works. Descartes did not know how mind and body interacted. He said, God takes care of this interaction, but he didn't explain how God does take care of that interaction. Some other substance dualists later 
took up that suggestion and tried to come up with an interpretation, an explanation of what happens when I want to take a sip of coffee, get new coffee, and that it actually happens. So that my mind influences my body. There seems to be a causal interaction between the mind and the physical world. Now, Nicolas Malebranche came up with the following. He says, only God is the true cause of things in the world. So that means that if I want to pick up my cup and my body does do that, it's caused by God. So it merely seems that my thought about raising my arm, picking up the cup, is the cause of raising my arm or picking up the cup. So my thought is basically the occasion, the event that happens in the mental world for God to raise my arm. God's a really nice guy. If I want to take a sip of coffee, I really need some new coffee. A sip of coffee, I need some caffeine. Thank you, God. God takes care of the interaction. That is, there is no real interaction. There seems to be interaction. Uh, this is called occasionalism because my thought is the occasion for God to raise my arm. Okay. So uh, that's one interpretation. The second interpretation of the suggestion is related to occasionalism, but it's not occasionalism. Uh, but it also involves God, obviously, because the suggestion is that God takes care of the interaction. But again, there's no real interaction between the mental world and the physical world. Both do exist, both worlds exist, but they run in sync. They run parallel to each other. They've been created by God in such a way that uh, if I want to do something in a mental world, then in a physical world this happens. But it happens in a physical world because of physical causes. The mental cause is absent. There is no mental cause of me picking up my coffee, cu uh, cu cup of coffee or taking a sip. But when I want to do that and I have this mental experience of my body picking it up and my, I have this experience of my body taking a sip, then basically the, those are two separate worlds both with their own causality. So my mental state causes other mental events and my physical body, my physical state causes other physical states, other physical events. And they run in sync like two clocks pointing at the same time and running uh, in sync. So this is called pre-established harmony. So God made the world way back when in such a way so that he established way back when a harmony between the two worlds so that they now run parallel. So there only seems to be interaction from this mental world to the physical world, me picking up my, my uh, with my body uh, the cup of coffee because my mind wants to. No, 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 no. That's not the case. That merely seems like that. But at the moment, my mind wants my body to pick that up. There are previous physical events in the physical world that actually cause my body to pick it up. There are all, all these animal spirits bumping against each other and making sure that uh, or causing uh, my body to pick up the cup of coffee. Right? So uh, that's basically how. Uh, Gölings and Leibniz uh, solve the, the interaction problem. Again, there is no real interaction, just like in occasionalism, there is no real interaction. It merely seems that way, but it, well, it explains in some way that if I want to pick up a cup of coffee, my body does so. Now, does this really work? Because it is obvious that it, that it doesn't, because uh, both occasionalism and parallelism suffer from uh, the same problem. If you invoke God to explain how anything goes, 
And of course, you want to know how God does do that. How, how, how does God create the world and uh, in, in, uh, establish this harmony? Uh, how does God uh, cause my physical body to raise my hand if I want to do that? So this is not insightful. This is basically one problem and you solve it by introducing a new one. You, you solve the problem, uh, how do the mind and body interact? Well, God takes care, how does he do that? I don't know. <laughs> Basically, that's what, what uh, Descartes said. God said, Descartes says, I don't know how he does it. And um, Malebranche and Gölings and Leibniz came up with suggestions what happens, but basically they say, well, there is no real interaction. They replaced it by two worlds running in sync or something like that, uh, or God being the only cause. But that is not insightful. You want to know how God uh, does, does do all this. So that's not insightful. Now, if you look back to the correspondence of uh, Descartes and Elizabeth, then at one moment she writes, I must admit that it would be easier for me to attribute matter and extension to the soul, so three dimensions to the soul, and a soul is by definition uh, uh, only a thinking thing and not an extended thing, than to attribute to an immaterial being, the soul, the capacity to move and be moved by a body. So she says, she, she was a, a good Christian uh, as well, uh, just, just like uh, Descartes, and uh, she does buy into uh, uh, the religious notions and she does believe in a soul, but she has really got this in, she, she really is convinced that this is not this is a, is a uh, this interaction problem is a real problem and she says well it's easier for me to understand the soul as a material thing that can push than to imagine a soul that has no dimensions moving a physical body or being moved by a physical body and i think that she is right or our normal conception of a soul is also something that has extension just take a look at these silly pictures i took uh, because i can't make uh, i can't use real uh, pictures from the movie ghost or uh, of uh, elizabeth's uh, paintings or something like that due to copyright reasons so how do we depict how do we think about a ghost well in this Scooby-Doo fashion where you have a sheet or something like that. So that's how we do it. We depict a ghost as having locations even, so in a movie ghost, if you look at, if you watch it, then the ghost is played by a physical human being. It's not that you say, well, okay, ghosts do not have any dimensions at all. So we just film the world without anything and just imagine the ghost there or that imagine the ghost there already is problematic so it it seems indeed that our common sense concept of a soul is conceptually incoherent on the one hand it doesn't have uh, uh, dimensions and on the other we are still ascribing some location to a spirit even if you believe in in ghosts then then you say things like i feel the presence of a ghost well yeah but where is it? Has it three dimensions then? If it's present in your room, then it's located in your room, then it has three dimensions. So, but it also doesn't have any dimensions. So I think Elizabeth was right, Princess Elizabeth was right in claiming that uh, there is some uh, conceptual incoherence in uh, our notion of a soul or a ghost. So for many philosophers and scientists, this is one of the reasons to reject dualism. They say, well, this interaction problem is actually fatal to uh, the view of dualists, but still um, many people in society that have no uh, scientific background uh, do believe in, uh, and even if they have a scientific background, they do believe in dualism. Uh, so there are also pseudoscientists that claim uh, 
that they have evidence in favor of it. And that, of course, is really relevant. Uh, is there any evidence to support the claim that the mind can exist as a kind of soul or ghost or as an entity in separation of um, the brain, of the physical world? And the answer is no. There are some scientists claiming that there is, and basically that makes them pseudoscientists. If you, say, if you claim to have scientific evidence uh, and there is not, then, well, you are either uh, really uh, not uh, using the scientific method properly or you're just a flat out liar. Uh, so uh, at the moment I'm recording, uh, as recording uh, of recording of this uh, lecture, I am not sure what I'm going to do with the word groups, but uh, there at least is one big case study in the book about electric voice phenomena that is one of those studies that allegedly would provide uh, evidence in favor of the existence of a separate soul, a soul as a um, thinking substance, and clearly that's not the case. Uh, so uh, if there is some way to make the work groups uh, actually work, then we'll take a look at another case study uh, as well, and otherwise I'll uh, make knowledge clips or something like that. We'll see uh, what I come up with. What's the verdict on substance dualism? Well, clearly our notion of the mind and our notion of the body, if we accept substance dualism, make it unintelligible how they interact. And it could be the case then, uh, so that Descartes is right. There is a mind, there is a body, both are substances, they do interact, but we don't, do not know how, and clearly we cannot understand how. Uh, so that at least makes substance dualism a problematic view, but you could also argue then, well, it's quite arrogant to think that we understand everything in the world, uh, so there might be things we don't understand. God understands everything, we don't. But they have also seen that dualism is conceptually incoherent. You could also say, well, if my theory shows that it's basically an a priori conclusion, that if I say the mind is like this and the body is like that, and that makes it impossible for them to interact, and still I claim that they interact, you could also say, well, then clearly there is a contradiction in my theory, which is fatal to the theory. And we already have seen that it's conceptually incoherent. We think of the soul as having dimensions. We depict it like that. If we think about ghosts, they can have pres a presence. Well, if they are present in a room, they have dimensions. They must have, otherwise they couldn't be present. So. Uh, not in the room or something like that. So that is, I think, uh, really problematic. Uh, and uh, most people would say that it's fatal. If you look at scientific data that would support substance dualism, really there isn't anything. Uh, in a book I discuss EVP, we'll see what we do in the work groups. And there, of course, there are many other case studies because if you say, well, EVP, if you, if you would agree as a substance dualist that EVP uh, would not uh, be the evidence in favor of substance dualism, then you could say, well, but telepathy is, or mind reading is, or telekinesis is, or haunted, haunted houses are, or reincarnations are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can also, you can always come up with something new. And believe me, people have done the proper research. Uh, James Randi, for instance, and uh, Michael Shermer, uh, great, uh, great minds, great uh, researchers have done the research. Uh, there are many books by them. Uh, James Randi actually has a foundation that gives you a million dollars if you can show anything in the realm of the paranormal to be real, to show any evidence. Uh, he has, uh, 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 I think, a PDF of uh, his account where the million dollar is in. Uh, he has that on his website. He has all these reports of people uh, claiming to be mind readers, to do something with telepathy, that ghosts exist, uh, whatever. 
and no, he has uh, always come up, ask them, well, what kind of test do, would you like to do then? So he, have, he has tested many of these people uh, um, and that could go out of their body or something like that. So if you could go out of your body on command, uh, that would, of course, be uh, uh, a really good, uh, really uh, good evidence in favor of that the mind can exist or function at least without the body. Um, it could be located anywhere else than the body is. He has never uh, had to give the million dollar to anyone. There is no evidence whatsoever, and he's not the only one. There are many. Uh, researchers that have done uh, the actual scientific research into all these things. Uh, point in case is Sue Blackmore. Uh, she started out believing in uh, dualism, basically, uh, based on her own experiences. Uh, she was interested in parapsychology, uh, and she is now one of the most fiercest uh, uh, skeptics in skeptics in the sense of people that. Uh, uh, argue against uh, anything in, in the world of the paranormal, actually in this domain of the paranormal, uh, actually to uh, be real. So she started with really having the open mind and doing the scientific research and she ended up, she ended up uh, saying, well, <laughs> it's all just nonsense. It doesn't exist. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, well, uh, take a look at Sue Blackmore, James Randi, uh, Michael Shermer. Um, there are many, many, many uh, things we can uh, you can look at, uh, and there is just no evidence. And then you, well, it's always wrong for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. So we should give up on substance dualism. If you take a look at the scientific data, if you take them seriously. If you take the scientific method seriously, you'll see that there is no evidence. So the conclusion would be then, or is, that a substance dualist, if you're still a substance dualist these days, you don't take science seriously. And especially at the university, we will do that. Maybe if you're Donald Trump, you can say, well, the hell with science, but not as an academic. So we need to abandon substance dualism. And I know that's difficult if you're a substance dualist. I think half of you might be substance dualists. I did some research uh, in previous years with students and I gave them a survey. Uh, maybe I'll do that this year as well. Uh, might be a good idea uh, to actually know how many of you start off as dualists. Um, so, uh, and then of course you have this strategy to look at this different phenomenon. So. Uh, if we debunk uh, electric voice phenomena, if we de de debunk uh, mediums, you can say, well, what about uh, uh, hand healing, uh, whatever, uh, uh, my mind is able to influence you from a distance if you do Reiki or something like that. Okay, so you can come up with a new case study and, well, if you make claims and you say you have the scientific evidence, we'll have to investigate that. We have to look into uh, that evidence. But at this moment, we have gathered already so much evidence about the evidence, alleged evidence, uh, there, there is no evidence in favor of substance dualism. So, uh, but it is a strategy and we have to take it seriously. So, uh, uh, there's a lot of work to be done for those uh, that uh, believe that, uh, well, dualism is right because you have to come up with an actual uh, scientific uh, research, uh, actual scientific research that actually provides the evidence uh, that has no flaws in, uh, in the method, uh, that's not just a flat out lie, that's not based on an, an is one anecdote. Uh, well, you have to come up with the evidence, and if you have, uh, if you claim to have evidence, we'll have to look into that. So that, of course, what you should do as a scientist. If we have to reject substance dualism, and in thinking about the mind, scientists and philosophers have done that. What then? 
is the next suggestion. What then is uh, what we can do next? One reason to reject dualism is that there is this interaction problem. So you might still believe in a mind that has no dimensions, but then you must try to get rid of the physical world. And that is what the idealists do. So uh, we'll take a look at that in the first part of next lecture. And then we'll take a look at the behaviorists and behaviorists really take science seriously they say that's that has to be our starting point so where dualism ends up not taking science seriously and we'll see that idealism has the same problem the behaviorists say well let's start by taking science seriously and then study the mind and we'll see then uh, how they think about our general problem how does the conscious mind in the, fit in the physical world we'll see first how the idealists think about that and then how the behaviorists think about that. That's it for lecture one. Stay safe.